An Economy of One with Gary Rathman. This is our country. Good evening and welcome again to An Economy of One. I am your host, Gary Rathman. I'm going to get right into this. We've uh, uh, got a, a guest we've never talked to before. Uh, Dan Bongino is with me. He served in the Secret Service. Uh, under George W. Bush in the Obama administrations. He ran for Senate in 2011 and for Congress in 2014 in Maryland, where he fell short by just one percentage point. That's got to be a killer in a heavily Democratic uh, district. He's been all over the place. I've seen him on Sean Hannity, Mark Levin. I uh, saw him on uh, O'Reilly the other night. He does commentary for CNN, Fox, MSNBC, NBC, everybody. Got a new book out called The Fight. A Secret Service Agent's Inside Account of Security Failings and the Political Machine. Dan, welcome to An Economy of One. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time with us. Your uh, publisher sent me uh, an advanced copy of the book, which I always love, and uh, read through it. Very readable, very interesting. I think it was released Monday of this week. and uh, uh, Tuesday, ve- yeah, Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday yeah. on this week? Uh, yeah. Ve- very, <laughs> very interesting book. Very uh, fascinating. Get the inside uh, look from the secret uh, secret service uh, aspect of it. Um, you know, and I listen to some of your blogs and, and read you on uh, uh, conservative, uh, what is it? Conservative review. Dot, yeah. Conservative yeah, review. Yeah. Dot com. So oh, uh, thank you for doing that. Man. You're, you're all over the place, but uh, <laughs> I got so many questions I want to ask. So I'm just going to dive in. And, and when yeah. we run out of time, we run out of time, but um, reading through the book, um, you know, you talk about the IRS scandal and uh, that kind of stuff. I want to touch on uh, the media. Uh, how has the media really helped uh, the country get into the the position we're in now? And can the media help us get out? I mean, it, it seems like the American people have such a distrust to the information we're getting now. Yeah, and they and they should. Uh, one of the chapters in the book is called uh, "Media Bias: Fighting Back," and I, I, that chapter I, I really enjoyed writing. That chapter. What what I tried to do in the book was to lay out a problem. Media mm-hmm. bias, that's a problem. Tell a story, either from the Secret Service or from uh, being a candidate, having been involved in the process or having been involved in campaigns, that really highlights the problem to a real world story and then present a solution. You know, anybody can complain about hey, media bias. All right, what are we going to do? Right, uh, right. The answer is we can fight back. And, and one of the proposals I lay out is I tell the story of my congressional campaign in Maryland where we were completely blacked out. There was a newspaper up there, the Herald Mail, uh, which is it has a pretty prominent distribution in Washington County, which was a district, uh, which was a county in the congressional district I ran, and they just would not cover our campaign. They refused. There was nothing uh, not credible about our campaign. We were out fundraising our opponent. We had a major national profile. Uh, we were doing very well in in polls, uh, and they just refused to cover it. So what we did. And what I suggest activists do is, you know, we reached out to people who had some influence, the Media Research Center and things like that, and we put together a near indictment of what this uh, this paper had refused to cover. And once it got some national attention, we exposed them, and after that, they, they showed up at every event. They hated <laughs> it. They hated doing it. But the point I was trying to make, and then I make it in, in a little more detail in the book, is, one, you have to fight back. I lay out mm-hmm. some other methods to do it as well, because if you, you're just going to be stepped on. Don't try to be friends with them if you're a conservative or a libertarian. They're not interested. They really don't care. It, it, it's a shame you have to shame them into appearing yeah. to do their job. I mean, they're not going to think objectively no matter what, I don't think. But No, they're not. You know, you're it, right. It is a shame. It's, it's awful. But there's no, there's no other way. to. Do it. They are dyed in the wool far leftists in the right, mainstream media, right. and you have to call them on it. You don't have a choice. Well, one of the things in, uh, I pulled out of the book, I, I, I tend to mark up the book. So I, I do read them, and I highlight them, put Post-it notes all over but one of the things that stuck in my mind, you had a quote in there uh, talking about your campaign. If the message doesn't fit on a Wheaties box, then no one will remember it. 
<laughs> yeah, I love that line. <laughs> Wheaties box messaging. And, they, you know, this goes for activists, for John Q. Public, for candidates, uh, campaigns from the local office to the federal level. One of the things we get lost in as conservatives and libertarians is, uh, you know, we tend to make academic arguments when the left argues strictly on emotion. In other words, mm-hmm. the left says, ah, oh, you know, you guys want to throw grandma off a cliff. And what do we do? We respond with, well, actuaries at Social Security stated that by 2037 we will be uh, – <laughs> You know, you get what I'm saying? Like, we yep. make reasoned arguments because conservatism is reasonable. There's nothing controversial about individual economic liberty or making the case for it. But I, I bring that Wheaties box messaging up because it's not – you can't do that sometimes in a public forum, whether you're debating or, or you're, you're on a news show or you're even talking to your kids. Sometimes you have to play the emotion game as well. And the way I used to do that was with the confrontational question. And that was my Wheaties box way of stopping just about any leftist argument. You know, they bring up, you know, well, you guys just don't like uh, whatever, uh, you know, m- m- minorities and minority communities. They say, really? Yeah, it's interesting you say that because the left has been in charge of large minority communities in their cities for decades, and they're completely collapsing. Like, well, what did we have to do with that? And then all of a sudden, there's like silence. So that's how you have to do it. You have to fit it on a Wheaties box and yeah. make it work. If it's too long, it ain't going to work. A terrific, terrific visual concept there. We're talking with former Secret Service agent Dan Bongino, author of the new book, The Fight, a Secret Service agent's inside account of security failings and the political machine. Um I, in your writings, in, in listening to your blog, and in, in the book, that kind of stuff. Uh, let's touch on the Second Amendment and these these executive orders coming out. And and I know this latest executive order on the surface was kind of innocuous, but a slippery slope is a slippery slope in my mind. And uh, once a little piece of liberty is gone, it's very very difficult to get it back. Uh, from your side of the equation, I mean, you're on the other side. You're protecting the president and people from people who might be bad people with guns. What's your thought on on the right to carry and, and that kind of stuff? Well, the left has always attacked the right to self-protection, because, uh, and there's a reason for this. You know, a lot of conservatives will, having read the Federalist Papers and other documents, they accurately state that the, you know, the right to, to, to bear arms was a protection against an overbearing, potentially tyrannical government. They're not, mm-hmm. that's, there's nothing black helicopter about that. You can read the documents uh, yourself. The founders are very clear on that. But, well, you know, when you read a lot of the documentation, that the pre-Constitution documentation, you start to realize there was another reason, I think, that the the, the founders were very concerned uh, about the Second Amendment and the right to be to bear arms not being infringed upon. And here's here's why: if you can protect yourself and protect your family and have the capability to do so, there's a certain freedom liberty component there that detaches you from the need, the necessity to be latched on to the you know to, to government, to be to be to be suckling off government all the time. There's there you you don't need it. Now listen, it's nice to have police protection. We enjoy mm-hmm. police protection. It's good to have. But the police are not there to protect you, make no mistake. They're there to enforce the laws. If they were there to protect you, you could call them right now and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to walk to my neighbor's house, it's a little dark, can you have a cop escort me? They're going to laugh at you. Right. They're not there right. for that. They're there to enforce the laws. The left doesn't like that. The left likes a constant attachment to government, economically, health care, through education, and even through public safety. So I believe there's a more nefarious reason by their, behind their constant attacks, and that's it. They want you to have your safety to be exclusively under the control of the state, and that's mm-hmm. really disturbing. The right to self-protection should be there when you triage your priorities, should be number one. You know, it's funny you say that because this has nothing – uh, you didn't address this in your book or anything, but I made the, the comment about that yesterday as to why the government's putting so much money or saying they're going to put so much money in self-driving cars. And they're doing it to protect us, to keep us safe. But it's one more thing they control in our lives. You know, that's that's a fascinating <laughs> it, it, that occurred to me in a different form, but I, you know, maybe I'll do a podcast on that. That's a great, really, that's very, that's very intuitive, and I, and I think you're absolutely right. I always say with the left of my own show, I say, uh, hey, listen, there's always a scam. You just have to find it. Usually right. it's by following the money or following the stream of control, how they're yeah. actually going to control it. And I don't disagree with you at all that there's probably another motive behind that, and that's probably it. Well, you know, I asked the question to my listeners, why would they do that? Why would the government want self-driving cars? And, and there's only only two answers. One, to funnel money to the cronies, okay? Yeah. And two, to control. You think a self-driving car is going to go 70 miles an hour in a 55? 
Uh, that's right. just never going to happen, you know. Yeah, that's a great so, point. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, but anyway, um, uh, I've only got you for a couple more minutes, so I'm going to throw a few things out there and yeah. and hit you with a hard question. Um, you talk a little bit about President Obama uh, in the book, actually quite a bit. Uh, a couple of things I pulled out of the book was, uh, you know, you're talking about leaders. Leaders spread the credit for success broadly, and they spread the blame for failures failures sparingly and you also make the distinction of the code and the team and yeah. both of those paragraphs or sentences that i just said uh you talk about in reference to president obama elaborate on that a little bit for us yeah when i was campaigning i noticed i'd be knocking on doors and even and remember my district was overwhelmingly democrat and there were two things i'd hear all the time even in the democratic district uh... bo bergdahl and benghazi would come up mm-hmm. all the time and remember this was a democrat district this is not some uh... you know far right district at all right. and I, I said you know this was, that was one of the last chapters i added to the book and i felt the need to discuss it because i don't think people understand really how out of touch the obama administration is with you know john and jane q public you know people americans that work for a living you know our military our cops our you know our architects our engineers our construction workers the one thing that americans have in their entrepreneurial blood our risk taking blood our revolutionary blood i mean what we have going what we have people who escape tyranny to come here mm-hmm. is we have this sense of loyalty to the to the cause you know the cause the team the team is more important than any individual whether that team is our family it's not always about us the best among us are always recognized for that Obama doesn't get that. He's never been part of a management team. He's never been part of a sports team. He's never been part of an organization that that had some collective focus or some big uh, audacious goal. It's always been about him. He's been a community organizer. He's been a politician. There's been nothing else. So when he got into the White House, I carried over into his poli- into his uh, into his leadership. And I used the Bo Bergdahl story as a perfect example of a guy who had no idea. I mean, he celebrated the trade of Bo Bergdahl, who, I mean, we may find out was a potential traitor once once it all comes out. Right. He, he right. celebrated it in the Rose Garden. I'm telling you, he did it with because he has no concept of how deeply that would impact Americans who felt like this guy... Really? We're about the team first, not about people who walk away from their military units. Mm-hmm. So I felt like it was important to bring that up. Uh, excellent, excellent point. I got to uh, got about a minute we're left with you. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hit you with a loaded question. Now I've I've sure. seen your picture, and I know you're part of the Secret Service. So please, I mean no insult by this. Sure. <laughs> I don't want you coming after me. But <laughs> you know, I I often think I, I met President. Um, George W. Bush in person, and of course there's Secret Service everywhere, and and none of you guys smile very much uh, when you're on duty, and I can understand that. But you, your your job is to step in front of the bullet. Uh, did yeah. did it ever occur to you with a a wife and family and and stuff? Did 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 it did it ever create a conflict that you might have to step in front of a bullet? protecting someone you don't really agree with that you don't think is really helping our country? No, no, not at all. I mean, we're, uh, listen, we're, we're, the, we're, you know, this is the greatest country in the history of mankind. The idea mm-hmm. of individual liberty started here and, and defending that, you know, we do our damage in the election booth here, nowhere else. And I was very careful. I mean, this is my second book. And the one, the one bad review, I didn't get a lot, but I got a few bad reviews on the first book. And it's the same theme every time. It's like, oh, we thought there was going to be some, like, inside baseball here about, <laughs> about, in other words, what, what President Obama eats for breakfast. No, I don't do that. The Secret yeah. Service, I was proud of what we did. And, you know, we do our damage in the election booth here. And President Obama is going to leave office exactly as he came in, healthy, uh, wealthy, maybe not wise, but healthy and wealthy. And we're going to keep him alive. I was proud to do it. Never, never occurred to me, you know, to, to, matter of fact, there were times I felt like I should do an even better job just yeah. to almost prove to the people who knew I was a, you know, was a Republican that I meant it. This was, yeah. this was what I was really about. Well, and, and once again, I meant no insult by the question. It was just one of those oh, things yeah, yeah. that's on my yeah. mind. So we've been yeah, talking no, no. with uh, former Secret Service agent Dan Bongino, author of the new book out this week, The Fight, the Fight: uh, Secret Service Agents' Inside Account of Security Failings and the Political Machine. Encourage you to get it. We'll have it on the website. Very, very readable. Read it in about three sittings. Uh, terrific, terrific insights. Dan, this has been a true honor. Uh, like Thanks. I said, I got about uh, an hour's more worth of questions. I hope we can <laughs> tap you on the shoulder again sometime soon and yeah. talk to you again. 
Hey, thanks a lot. It's an honor to be here. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dan. Thank I'm Gary Rathman.